thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to come along and talk to you today. Uh, I just wanted to talk a bit about the importance to HLF of, of resilience as a concept across all the heritage that we support and tell you a little bit about the journey that we've been on, sort of a little bit of looking back and what's happened so far, but more perhaps looking forward, thinking about the context for change and, and where, we're, where we're going now, what we're doing at the moment. And I failed already. My PA has given me clear instructions. It says click here and don't click here on each slide. And I've managed to miss a, a click here. So uh, I'm doing very badly. Um, what I really wanted to do was to talk about, from our point of view, the uh, importance of places of worship as a whole across the UK uh, in the things that we fund. Many of you will know that, that HLF is the, really probably the largest funder of heritage. It's been going now for nearly 25 years in, in its capacity as a lottery funder, a bit longer in its capacity as a heritage memorial fund. And one of the sort of early things that, that decisions that was made was actually not to define heritage, but to allow people to come and talk to us about why they thought something was important and why it was really valuable. And I think one of the sort of hugely important things that places of worship have, obviously, is their role in their community, uh, and also the fact that they represent often some of the oldest heritage that we have around the UK. So there's never been any doubt in our mind about the importance of churches and places of worship within the heritage that we support. Over the years, we've been providing funding um, across a whole range of different programs to both uh, places of worship and cathedrals. And, and just to give you some sense of the size of the funding that we've provided, it's something like £850 million over more than 5,800 projects. I was quite relieved that John put one up and said he was happy with it, I have to tell you, as he was going through that. I was sitting there slightly with bated breath, waiting for him to put up one and say, and look what they did here. Uh, so uh, hopefully most of them would meet the tough standards that, that John uh, brings to these things, and quite rightly so. 100 million of that's gone to 61 cathedrals, um, again spread over a number of projects. And we're really aware that the sorts of projects that we fund can all have a huge impact, but they can range from really quite small things that people want to do at a local level to really major transformative projects. And one of the things that's quite interesting I found when I went back to look at the funding that we put into the sort of places of worship sector is that applications have come in across a whole range of different programs um, and that, that churches and places which have been, have been just as successful as other organizations implying, in applying to us for some of the programs that weren't specifically targeted at them. So for example, um, First World War, we've had a significant number of applications and, and, and put a lot of funding into that. Young Roots, which was our sort of previous young people's program, Sharing Heritage and Heritage Grants, of course, which is our main open program. And, and I was interested here, one of the ones that we funded relatively recently is a, is a piece of work that's being done about bats in churches. So uh, hopefully this will address what I know is a pretty key issue for a lot of people in this room. One of the things that's happened quite recently has been the Taylor Review of Sustainability of English Churches and Cathedrals, and we were really pleased to be involved in that. I'm sure you've probably heard that mentioned already today. Sir Peter Luff, who is our chair, sat on the panel, um, and we are really excited about the opportunity to learn from the pilots that are now going on, being largely, largely led, I think, by Historic England looking at the, the work that's coming through those. And we're very proud, I have to say, of the funding that we've been able to put into places of worship over the years since we were first set up. There, there is a need for us to change. We're sitting in a very changing landscape. Um, obviously, we sit in a very changing landscape from a political perspective, and I'm certainly not going to attempt to talk about that. But uh, even if you look sort of more locally to, to HLF, I, I think we feel 
that there's a lot of things that are happening in the world that we need to reflect. We very much recognize the, the need for resilience to be a key feature of the things that we support. And I have to say that is true across all the different types of heritage that we support. Um, there are challenges facing organizations all around the country in terms of making sure that they are sustainable in the future. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But in terms of the sort of broader context, we ourselves have recently been reviewed by government. Our tailored review was completed at the end of last year. Uh, and there's also been a review um, of funding for museums and how they operate, called the Mendoza Review, um, which in addition to the sort of tailor review that was going on. So there's been quite a lot happening in the sort of 12 months during 2017. What the, two, the first two reviews I mentioned say for us is that we need to be thinking about new ways of working, about making sure that we're really efficient in what we do, that we get best value from national lottery funding, um, and we're trying to build that into our plans for the future. We've also been out and consulted people. So we went out and had, um, for the first time, from our point of view, a, a consultation with lottery players and said, you provide this money, you know, what do you want us to do with it? What, from your point of view, is, is important? And it's been really quite interesting to see the sorts of feedback that we've had from that. Um, and we've also been out to more widely to stakeholders. I hope many of the people in this room have been involved in that consultation. And we've had a, a significant piece of, of, of public research carried out. Overall, the other bit of context, I suppose, that you're probably aware of is, is the size of lottery income that's available to us, which is still very significant. We have a budget this year of 190 million pounds but that's not as high as it was a couple of years ago. So what it has meant is that there's increasing competition for the funding that we have, because the other issue, of course, is the disappearance of other types of funding that people were relying on. Um, European funding is one, but also local authority funding that had been available in some areas is becoming more and more difficult. It hasn't disappeared, but it's become much more difficult to get hold of. So, all of that together has meant that we have really high pressure on our funding. And I spent the last sort of 10 years of my life before I moved into this role working for an organization which applied to uh, the Heritage Lottery Fund for much of its funding. So nobody knows better than me the frustration it can cause spending time and energy on an application and working on it maybe for a couple of years only to find that you're not successful at the end of that. So part of what we're trying to think about is how are we fairer to people about that? How do we try and give people an indication of the likely chances of success earlier in the process so that they don't waste as much time without closing out, this is the thing that really worries our trustees, without closing out the opportunity for people to come to us with really exciting, interesting, innovative, and actually quite risky sometimes projects, but which we don't want to lose sight of. So it's, it's a difficult balance to get those two things right. But we certainly know that we need to simplify the process. So far, nobody has come to me and said, Ros, can you make the process more complex, please? <laughs> there, is a, there is a sort of clear message coming back from people that, um, that it, needs, it needs to be as simple as it can be. Clearly, we're giving away what effectively is public money, it's lottery players' money. There has to be a strong process for that to make sure that it's handled objectively and fairly and that people feel that you can justify where and why it's been given. But equally, uh, we need to be really sure that people, the people we want to, uh, to be able to access it that can do so, that it's not, we're not putting barriers in people's way. So right now, what we're doing, I think I've actually failed dismally to keep my slides moving forward despite the prompt that I had. Right now what we're doing is um, focusing on the last year of our current funding program, which is our strategic funding framework at number four, which isn't very exciting, but that's what it was. Um, and uh, from our point of view, the important thing is that, is that we deliver that effectively this year. Uh, and that we then, we're then planning to have a period of transition with the new announcements around 
new funding coming out uh, and starting from April next year, but with announcements coming out at the beginning of 20, uh, 80, so 2019. Sorry. Um, what we're doing in the meantime is to deliver against the commitments that we have made for, um, for example, in relation to places of worship. I'm very aware that the changes that we made last year to our funding programs caused a lot of anxiety and concern for people, uh, I'm sure many of them in this room, and I think we completely put our hands up to the fact that we could have communicated and handled that better. What I do think that we have been able to do is to give a commitment that we would ensure that the same level of funding continued to go to churches. Last year, that effectively amounted to 20 million pounds, and we, we put more than that in. We, more, we easily beat the target that we'd set. Because it's a proportionate target, that's likely to be something like 13 and a half million pounds this year, reflecting the lower grants that we're giving out overall. And we're working really hard to make sure that that sum of money does go into the, into the places of worship sector. I have to say that does rely on people bringing us good applications. So it does rely on people putting the time and energy in to making sure that they're applying to us with something that we're able to fund. What we saw, not surprisingly perhaps, just after we moved from the old system to the new system, was applications that hadn't been successful under the GPAS system sort of being brought back to life and presented under the open programs. And not surprisingly, if they hadn't been successful under one, they weren't going to be successful under another. I think we're seeing some much stronger stuff coming forward now. We are seeing some very successful uh, applications, but we're tracking it hard, uh, and there is support available if people are finding it difficult to move from one system to the other. We're really conscious that, you know, we, we are confident that there are very good projects out there that we can support, but we need to help you to present them to us in a way that meets the, uh, the requirements that we have before we're able to fund them. What I wanted to just give you was one or two examples of things that we have um, been involved with and have supported, which are, we think, really excellent examples of how um, resilience can work well. And I wanted to start with one which is um, on the Diocese of, of Newcastle, Inspired Northeast, uh, and I'm not... Um, giving this one, I think the people may be in the room today, but that's another reason I've chosen it, is just a really great example where empowered congregations in the northeast um, set out to manage and maintain their buildings. We gave a grant of £222,000 and allowed a team of volunteers and professionals to use their combined experience and expertise to build sustainable futures for much loved and vulnerable buildings. It focused on six churches but offered support to 12 others. And it worked on everything from developing business plans to looking at repairs to building on fundraising opportunities and new ways of engaging the community. So it was working across a number of churches. I think for us that was what was really interesting about it. We've also had um, some other really excellent examples from people like the Society for Protection of Ancient Buildings who did the work on developing maintenance co-ops. Some of you may be familiar with that. But again, looking at ways in which they could provide free of charge, practical support to ded through dedicated staff and volunteers. Um, and that was, from our point of view, the sort of project that we were really pleased to support. And then finally, one that I wanted to mention was the National Churches Trust, Yorkshire Maintenance Project, where uh, with you know, a relatively modest grant of £90,000, uh, there was a project to develop maintenance book of services, making it much easier for, con for congregations to access vital services. So uh, providing regular maintenance and uh, preventing it from turning into a large and expensive repair item. So a number of really good examples of projects of where organisations have worked not just to address their own issues but to work across the sector. You might wonder why I'm putting a picture of a park in front of you, but um, what I wanted to sort of talk just briefly about is the work that we have done outside of the places of worship sector with other organisations who face in many ways similar challenges. Uh, they are 
the pressure on parks has been huge because of the reduction in budgets that is available to them. And they have had uh, quite a tough time um, with significant cuts in both staffing and, and facilities available. And what we've been doing with the park sector is some work around what are the options. So rather than funding each individual park to go away and look at what the options might be, we are funding some pieces of work which we then share across the sector. And we've actually done that a couple of times. And most recently, we've been doing some work with Newcastle City Council, who are rethinking the whole way in which they deliver um, green space services. And, and they're planning to set up uh, a trust in which to move all those facilities into so that they can start to deliver it in a new way, having been faced with some really dramatic cuts in terms of, of their funding. We've worked with the National Trust, who've been providing lots of expertise and helping them to increase community involvement and volunteering. But I think the important thing for us was trying to see whether we could use that project to look at solutions that might work more broadly for other organisations faced with the same challenges. And as a principle, that's something we're very keen to do in the future. So looking forward, um, what are we doing? Well, we uh, um, are thinking about our strategic funding framework starting in 2019. Uh, I mentioned that we've been out consulting and the sort of feedback we've had from, the, uh, from players in particular is that they really support the breadth of funding that we give, the fact that we d define heritage so broadly. They, one of the things I found really interesting was that there was a very strong support from them for using heritage to alleviate social issues. They felt really strongly that heritage had a role in addressing loneliness and addressing homelessness and in, in, in all sorts of different mental health issues. They really felt that you know, whilst investing in heritage was important, it was that role in terms of social impact that they valued. Is that your job? Sorry, can I finish talking? The role of, uh, of HLF has, has been over many years, this is in no way new, it has used heritage for the benefit of people and communities. It took a view very early on that what, I'm sorry, do you want me to answer the question or would you like to continue shouting at me? I'm, I've heard the question, I'm now trying to answer it and it's actually not a point for questions right now so perhaps I could finish what I'm saying. I'm happy to say that the strong view, some of you in this room may not agree with it, that the strong view of the Heritage Lottery Fund, not introduced by me for many years, has been that the value of heritage, particularly because it's lottery players' money, it's the value of heritage, it's the, what it delivers for people and communities. It is not enough to protect heritage in itself. There may be the right thing for other organisations, that's not what we do. So, uh, Looking forward, what do people feel about the, uh, the role of HLF? There was clear support in the recent consultation that we did for us to think about our role, not just in terms of providing funding, but actually inspiring, leading and resourcing the UK's heritage. One of the things that I would really like to, to see us becoming more engaged in is using our funding more effectively to leverage new money into heritage. Because I feel that we need to find ways in which we can address the gaps that we have in things that, that need to be funded. I was saying to somebody over lunchtime, we are now seeing projects coming forward that are fantastic projects. We would love to fund them. We simply do not have sufficient funding to do it. So we must find ways in which we can, can bring more funding into Heritage to address some of the gaps that have been created. I can't see a huge amount more now on what the next uh, strategic funding framework will look like. But what I can tell you is that we will be producing more information on that in January next year. We'll be coming out with the uh, limits in terms of the grant applications in August, so the grant thresholds will be coming out in August this year, but the, the more detailed information will be coming out in January next year. 
You might ask why that's coming out later than we would normally have done. The reason for that is quite simple. We have uh, had to wait for the outcome of the tailored review before we were able to start our consultation. We then had to wait for the result of the consultation. The effect of all that is that it's knocked on and it means that we'll be going to the board in October this year. Um, so we, are not, we cannot obviously present it until we've had it signed off by our own board. So I'm sorry that it's tighter than it's been in previous years, but I actually think the value has been huge from our point of view. I'm sorry, I'm very conscious I'm running people late. The final thing that I wanted to just talk to you about is some work that we're, we're doing now. Um, We've been having conversations with the sector over the last few months about how we might provide better support going forward and what would be helpful and useful. And in 2017, we had some round tables with some sector stakeholders and discussed what might be uh, one of the sort of things that would be a useful contribution. In addition, obviously, to the funding that we provide through our normal programs, I hasten to say there's substitutes in no way for that. The, point of the um, work that we're now proposing is a joint programme with other partners, and we'll be announcing more detail about that shortly, uh, working on something called Inspiring Ideas, which is actually taking some of that thinking we did around other types of heritage, looking at models which might be helpful and can be learning experiences for other organisations and using them uh, across the sector. So it's a partnership initiative. It will be open to places of worship across the UK to apply to it. I, I don't want to raise undue expectations. This is a learning program, so there will be a relatively small number of, of projects that will be funded across the totality, but the information that comes from that will be widely shared and will be made available. There'll be much more information. There's an announcement on our website today, and there'll be more information available uh, in the next few weeks. But I think what it will enable is the opportunity to think about ways in which you can focus on resilience for particular places of worship, so that you can think about what things work for you in terms of how you, how you take your church forward. So, in conclusion, Thank you very much for inviting me along today. Um, I'm shooting off to uh, give another presentation somewhere else, so apologies that I'm not able to stay around to take questions, but I hope that has been helpful to some extent. I'm sorry also that I haven't been able to give you more detailed information about the, uh, the future funding plans, but as soon as we have that, that will be made available. Thank you very much. Thank you.